Welcome to the Mediation Africa Forum virtual series hosted by Wassili Anahab. What animal are you today? Or what animal did you wake up as and why? Oh, hello. Hello. Hello, Christine. We're getting you loud and clear. Yes, I woke up as a fish. <laughs> okay. And why are you a fish, my dear? <laughs> I went to the beach and I was swimming in the ocean. I've just come back. So I just wanted to feel the water, the breeze, the extra oxygen. I just be playful before the day starts. Awesome. Thank you, Christine. Thank All right. you. All right, Catherine, you say you're a leopard. Why are you a leopard, Catherine, if you don't mind? Why do you feel like a leopard? Uh, I wake up feeling great. And, and very courageous. Nothing better than waking up and feeling courageous. Awesome. Yes. Caroline, you say you're a giraffe. You've woken up with a rather long vision for the days ahead. That is great. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to the Mediation Africa Forum a virtual series hosted by Wassili uh, Today, the 15th day of uh, October 2020, I am your station moderator, Sarah Atair. Our event today is the quarter three uh, October 2020 Mediation Day Symposium, where we host three sessions, uh, this particular session, uh, which runs from 7 to 8.30, the afternoon session at 2 o'clock, and the evening session at 4 p.m. We shall begin with a recitation of the national anthem in English. 
O God of all creation, bless this our land and nation. Justice be our shield and defender. May we dwell in unity, peace, and liberty, plenty be found within our borders. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this uh, particular session is recorded and will be available on Wasili uh platforms. Uh, we are grateful for the questions and comments received during registration, and we encourage you uh, to put your comments and questions in the chat facility. In converging the community of professional mediators in Kenya and Africa, Wasiliana Hub hosts events in person and virtual, uh, which are weekly or monthly meetups, as well as the quarterly mediation symposiums, the annual strategy conference, which is in its second year, and the African International Mediation Week, which kicks off in December 2020. All the events and discussions are aligned to the Strategy 2020 theme, ADR Tomorrow for Africa, which is focused on positioning, policy and practice of mediation and dispute resolution. ADR Tomorrow for Africa is to reimagine, rewire and retool in positioning policy and practice so as to transform the dispute ecosystem. By ADR, we mean appropriate, alternate, as well as alternative. Wasiliana Hub is creating a society in which all people have access to a neutral option in resolving conflict and the ability to be able to achieve sustainable income, sustainable outcomes that enrich lives. Ladies and gentlemen, the focus of our quarter three symposium today is the economics of dispute resolution. Uh, this particular session, uh, we will be taken through by our guest speaker, uh, Derek Banga, who is a trainer, coach, and facilitator with his company, Public Image. The topic that he will take us through is emotional intelligence for mediation and dispute resolution professionals. Uh, Derek is a trainer, coach, and facilitator with his company, Public Image, where he supports organizations and individuals for high performance. He has trained and worked with hundreds of individuals and teams, helping leaders, entrepreneurs, and young people accelerate their personal and professional success through developing effective communication and interpersonal skills. By helping them promote this inter emotional intelligence leadership, communication, and executive presence skills, he has greatly increased their earning potential. Derek is a multiple TEDx speaker and regular contributor in the media, giving advice on being seen, heard, and remembered for the right reasons. He has a degree from SHU University in USA, studied for an MBA, at, uh, the, at the School of Economics in Finland and is a graduate of Strathmore Business School, as well as a certified intelligence practitioner with Genos International. He previously worked as a financial analyst with Bloomberg in New York and risk analyst with EdTech Risk Institute in France. He was also a senior communications strategist with the London-based consultancy, Africa Practice. In addition to training and coaching, Derek is a keynote speaker at conferences and a corporate host and moderator. Derek is an ambassador with the Pan-African Advocacy Group, Africa 2.0, as well as a qualified fitness instructor. Uh, this morning, Derek tells us that he feels like a lion because he's super confident. And Derek, we are happy to have you with us today. Good morning once again. Good morning, Sarah, and thank you for that wonderful introduction. And good morning, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> I hope you can all see me in my full glory. Yes, and we can. Fantastic. That's always great. So, um, I'm like I said, I'm delighted to be here. This is an awesome opportunity to speak to to this community about a topic that I feel very passionately about, which is uh, emotional intelligence. And um, 
I have a few thoughts to share with you. I'm going to share with them with you in a visual presentation. So I have a, some slides that I'm going to share, but I'd like this to be not so much of a talk, maybe a conversation. Yes, I'll be doing most of the talking, but I would love to get you involved. We've been in this virtual medium for how many months now? And I know what it's like. You get up, you log on to a webinar, the speaker is somewhat interesting, you pay attention for a little bit, and then, you know, you start doing what everybody does, multitasking, <laughs> checking your emails, <laughs> boiling an egg, <laughs> you know, <laughs> helping the children's homework. So if you are with me today and you're going to pay 100% attention, I would like you to go into the chat and just put a Y or a yes. We'll be doing a lot of that today. And forgive me, this is my style, but just put in a Y or a yes if you're excited about today's topic, uh, just so that we know we're on the same page. All right, Christine, I get a yes. So I like that. And as those yeses are coming in, I'm going to share my screen. Okay. All right, fantastic, ladies and gentlemen. Awesome, so let's, let's get started. I have quite a bit to share, and there's always never enough time. Just to add on to that wonderful introduction that Sarah gave in terms of why I do what I do, I remember when I was young, I loved uh, superheroes. I love the superhero genre. I still do. By the way, that slide right there is a shout out, of course, to the late, great Chadwick Boseman, one of my favorite all-time heroes, the Black Panther. But, I, you know, I love the superhero genre because I wanted to have a superpower myself. And the superpower I wanted to have, believe it or not, was to be invisible. <laughs> I wanted to, you know, when my parents chased me out of the the room because they were about to have an argument or they were going to discuss something. I wanted to be able to sneak back in and hear what they were going to say. Or my sister, perhaps behind her closed door, talking to God knows who on the, on the phone. So all of those things, I, I wanted to be invisible. But also, because in school, in class, I wanted to be at the back of the classroom and not be called upon by the teacher. I wanted to be invisible. Now, fast forward 30 something odd years, here I am today in the most visible of professions, standing up in front of important people like yourselves, talking about subjects that are near and dear to me. In fact, not only do I have the most visible of professions, but I hopefully help my clients. Well, I shouldn't say hopefully. I should always say I know that I help my clients. I say go from miserable to visible. So they are, can be visible in their, in their careers. And they're visible through their leadership potential, through their executive presence, through the emotional intelligence, the topic I'm tackling today, and other interpersonal skills, which to me have become a must have, particularly in 2020. So that sort of maybe gives you some insight as to why I do what I do. You know, as I was preparing for this topic, I just typed in, mediation and emotional intelligence. And I don't know if you can see the results over there. 26,600,000 odd results on Google. Which to me means that this is a particular combination of topics that is being searched for or is being looked at or is being considered quite a bit. This is not nice to have. I think these skills of EI or emotional intelligence are a must have, ladies and gentlemen. And again, as part of this in hoping to get you involved, if you have any questions, concerns, ideas, please throw them in the chat. I'm sure Sarah will be able to share them with me. We don't necessarily have to wait for the end of my talk or my presentation. We can engage even as I'm talking. So I'd ask you in, in the morning, how do you, what animal are you? I will continue that theme. How are you feeling right now? And I've put there a number of, of um, emotions, if you will. Distract, annoyed, bored, hopeful, curious, happy. Perhaps in the chat you can share with me. What are you feeling right now? And I'll take a moment and pause so that I can see those results. 
or at least Sarah can read them out to me. Thank you. How are you feeling right now? And I'm just going to take a second because I realized I hadn't turned my phone off. I'm just going to turn it off here. Sarah, is anything coming in? Yes, there's a lot. Uh, uh, happy. Happy, okay. Uh, curious, hopeful, curious. Great, uh -huh. anxious, anxious. Anticip anticipation, uh -huh. thoughtful. Awesome positive and very hopeful. All right, great. So that exercise, if you will, is actually one of the first and really key areas. The introduction to emotional intelligence, if you will, is self-awareness, of which I will talk a little bit more about later on. But getting in touch with how you are feeling is one of the key things, particularly in the profession that you ladies and gentlemen have profession that you have is regularly so when's a good time to do it in the morning first thing in the morning when you get up how are you feeling and then of course the logical conclusion to that or the logical thought that follows is if you're feeling distracted or annoyed or bored whatever it is that you're feeling why am I feeling that once you can name an issue or a problem or how you're feeling then you can get to the root cause of why you might be feeling a certain way. Because these emotions, and um, they say that we have as many emotions as we have thoughts during a day, which number in the thousands. Some of them are conscious, some of them are subconscious. Subconscious, <laughs> okay? But they do lead to either productive or unproductive decisions, behavior, and performance. Every decision that you make, whether you are aware of it or not, is predicated on some feeling, whether you are able to recognize that feeling or you are just going with a reflex. Okay, I'll give you an example. In the good old days, when I talk about the good old days, I talk obviously pre-pandemic. Uh, I would regularly get in my car. So I'm doing most of my stuff from my home, work from home over here. Get in my car, jump on the road, and Matatu cuts me off in traffic. Now, that's the bane of my existence, Matatus, you know? And that Matatu cutting me off in traffic or jumping in front of me or jumping the lights or whatever infraction a Matatu driver would do would drive me up the wall. In fact, the emotion I'd feel would be very, very strong, sometimes unreasonably um, unproductive, I would say. And then my decision, <coughs> excuse me, would be maybe to chase the matatu. Instead of heading to where I'm going, chase that matatu and roll down the window to yell at the matatu driver. You know, and first of all, matatu mendikwa, rude boys forever. So maybe that's just a mindset or an attitude. You're not going to change. <laughs> yes. But you know, as I started getting into this topic of emotional intelligence and learning more about it, I realized that I could be the master of my decisions. And rather than get triggered by that behavior, I could actually bring something else into play. Like for example, empathy, which by the way, is one of the hardest things to do, particularly in that instance. How do you empathize with somebody who is routinely or egregiously breaking the traffic laws? But if you engage empathy, then thoughts like, okay, he has to do this because you know, half his money is being taken by his boss, or, you know, he didn't wake up in, you know, a nice apartment somewhere. So, you know, he's doing all of these things to earn a living and support his family. Then my decision might not be to chase him and yell at him. My decision might be, you know what? It's okay. In gear too. It's our boss. And then I feel better. And actually decisions affect your behavior because you know how you say it? People have a pattern of behavior. Every time something happens, you know how this person is going to react. And ultimately, it affects your performance. Performance. At the end of the day, your performance is about bringing these parties together and hopefully coming up with a win-win situation for both. But to reach that peak performance, 
you have to be aware that all of your decisions are predicated on, or all of your behavior is predicated on some decision which is influenced by your emotion. I hope that sort of has started you thinking along that path. And so it starts with controlling these thoughts that you have. Okay, let me share my next slide. The way people feel determines the way they can engage. And we talk about engagement is about how you show up, how you interact with anybody. The Jumia guy who's dropping off a package at your gate, how you engage the person who's in your house right now with you, your family. If you feel anxious, we tend to behave in ways that are reactive. If we feel mistreated, we tend to be disengaged. These unproductive behaviors are all predicated on these feelings that we have. And by the same token, if we feel appreciated, informed, valued, then subsequently we will act in more productive ways. It's, it's, there's a logical sort of way that everything that we do can be controlled. And everything, by the way, starts here in the mind. So that kind of leads me to my definition of emotional intelligence. So it's a skill and a skill can be harnessed, a skill can be practiced, a skill can be improved. It's a skill to perceive, manage, express your own emotions better. Okay. And just for the record, I'm not talking about never feeling anxious or triggered because we're human beings we're going to feel that way, but we can manage it better. We can um, perceive it and then choose to do something else. And by the way, it's not just your emotions, it's the emotions of other people as well. Also manage their expectations. Also manage that person that you're dealing with who you know, every time you sit with them to discuss some issue, they're always flying off the handle. And it's not about changing them. Emotional intelligence is not about telling somebody where to Leah. It's about you <laughs> managing how you feel when that person talks in a way that is disrespectful or flies off the handle. The ball is in your court. Now, I would love for them to be able to manage their own emotions, but you can start with managing yours. So I hope that makes sense. The um, what is this organization? This is the World Economic Forum. So they meet in Davos every year. Clearly, obviously, they didn't meet this year, but every year that they meet, and these are the most powerful men and women in the world who discuss issues of import to this global village that we live in. They come up with a list of skills that you need, and they usually project them a year or two ahead. So these were top skills that are needed in 2020, from the meeting last year. Now look at that list over there. Prominent on that list, certainly for me, is emotional intelligence at number six. By the way, the ones that I have ticked, like creativity or negotiation or service orientation, are actually all related to this EI, this EQ. It's, I, I keep saying this and it's a cliche, it's not a nice to have, it's a, it's a must have. Okay. Uh, do we recognize that, gentlemen? If we do, put in a yes in the chat if you know who that gentleman is. I'm sure we all do. <laughs> Sarah, any yeses coming in? I think yes. On... Yes. Okay. Yes. So, obviously, yeah, Jack Ma, right? Arguably one of the most successful businessmen or entrepreneurs, as you say, in the world, certainly in China. He was speaking at the World Economic Forum. I want you just to listen to what he had to say. Let me see if you guys can hear this. I, I believe if a person wants to be successful, you should have a high EQ. But if you don't want to lose quickly, you should have a high IQ. But if you want to be respected, you should have, have high LQ, the Q of love. So those three Qs put together, a lot of men, they have a high IQ, but low EQ, and a very tiny LQ. <laughs> Women balance-wise, they're the best. 
if you want your company to be successful, if you want your company to operate with wisdom, with care, woman is the best. Okay, can I get an amen from the ladies? <laughs> I, you know, I'm curious. In this, um, the work that you do, are women more suited to this? Or are men more suited? I'm curious. Just put your thoughts in the, in the chat box and maybe it's something we can discuss we can discuss later. But what I liked about what Jack Ma was saying is that he talks about the three cues. Obviously, clearly, emotional intelligence, you need that. And then he brings in the LQ or the Q of, of love. I think the point that he was making, what I'd like to reiterate, that it's not your academic qualifications. It is not your technical skills that is going to make you successful. You need to have that third leg of the stool, if you will, which to me is becoming even more important, which is this thing called EQ or emotional intelligence. Those words are used interchangeably. You know, if I was to ask you, how many, how many cells are there in the human body? So, I mean, we, we, we were made up of cells, right? Hair, skin, everything is made up of, 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 of cells. How many cells do you think they are in the human body, if you could, um, if you could count them. And Sarah, should we allow people maybe to unmute themselves if they want to talk? Are we, we're, I don't think we're that many. Or would you prefer mm -hmm. they just put things in the chat? Um, they, they could perhaps unmute and, you know, shout yeah. quickly. Uh, yeah, I think we're a small enough group so that we're not going to be overwhelmed. Okay. Um, I, millions, possibly billions. I don't even think the number has been quantified. <laughs> a heck of a lot, right? Billions of cells. Each of those cells if you were to drill down to its molecular structure or level, very powerful microscope, and you looked at that, 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 each of those individual cells, of which there are billions, each of those cells is not static. They are moving. Okay? Each of those cells individually in any part of your body is, is actually moving. And when things move, they create energy. So all of you right now are a literal walking mass of this tremendous amount of energy. But here's where it gets interesting. I believe that that energy is as much a product of how you feel, your emotions. There's a fantastic book called The Molecules of Emotion written by Candy Spirit. And she delves this topic into a lot more detail where the energy that you give out is, 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 is as a result of how you feel. In fact, um, do you remember The Secret, right? Do you remember that book or the DVD or something was very popular in the 2000s, early 2000s? Where, how, how, how do you, there's that transfer of, of emotion. So how do you, for example, get positive feelings or positive energy, right? You give out positive energy and positive feelings. If you say positive things, the universe rewards you, right? By the same token, if you're a negative person, that's all you can, everything that comes out of your mouth is just negative, right? Karma comes back to, to bite you, right? So you're, you're, you're giving out that energy. You know that person who walks into the room and the temperature in the room just goes, people just say, because nobody wants to be around that person because every time they open their mouth, they have nothing positive to say. Versus the person who walks in and the room lights up. By the way, what kind of person are you? <laughs> do you light up a room or do you have this negative energy about you, right? So, and in fact, if you look at that word emotion, if you break it down, the E and the motion, energy in motion, this transfer of energy. All right, let me take this thought a little bit further. I want you to think of your best Let's keep this professional. So let's say boss, for example, somebody that you reported to. Could be somebody now, it could be somebody in a previous, you know, job. 
the, the best boss that you were around, okay? And what I'm going to ask you to do, in fact, I should have asked you earlier, is if you have a pen and paper, hopefully you have something to jot this down. I'm going to ask you some questions and you're going to rank this best, best boss or best supervisor or something like that on this scale of one to five, where five is that they were better than everybody else, okay? One, they were worse than everybody else. Three, they were about average, and then two and four follow sequentially. I hope that makes sense. So you're just gonna rank them, and you don't have to, you know, the question, if I ask you, I'm just gonna pull up my whiteboard here. So if it's question one, just put there, say for example, you want to score them a four, like that. You just put one and four. Okay, so here are your questions, and I have se several, but I'm just going to ask you a few. Okay, so here's the first one. First question is, this person demonstrated an awareness of their mood and emotions. Now, interpret that as you will, but again, just put question one and then rank them, one to five. Five, they were better than everybody else. One, they were the worst. Three, they were average. Okay. Uh, then question two <laughs> that actually came up, making other people feel appreciated. Okay. So again, how would you rank that person? Making other people feel appreciated. All right. And then question three is uh, they were open and honest when they made a mistake. Hmm? <laughs> you know, I, I work for myself clearly, but I've worked for other organizations and I remember whenever things went wrong, who do you bl always blame finance? Our to our finance, our to our company. Anyway, it's just, there was something in that organization. We, we never took the blame ourselves. All right, I'm just gonna ask you those three questions. All right, so you've ranked them, okay. Now, I want you to think now of the most challenging, and we'll keep it in the same line, the most challenging boss, supervisor, someone that you reported to that really difficult person. And you're going to answer those three questions again. Similarly, you're going to rank them. So question one, when it came to demonstrating an awareness of their mood and emotions, this person, how would you score them? Would you score them one, two, three, or four? So again, just to make sure we're on the same track, if I had number two over here, let me say I would give them a score of, I don't know, two. Okay, and then the second question is making other people feel appreciated. How would you how would you score them? And then number three, open and honest when they made mistakes. You know, my bad, makosa niangu, pole. My, you know. Okay, I hope everybody has 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 been able to do that. Okay, so now what I'm going to ask you is to add up the scores. So add up the scores of the best, add up the scores of the most challenging. Okay. All right. All right, now in the chat, maybe you can share some of those scores. So share maybe the scores of the, 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 the best the best. Just, 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 just put in, type in the number. And Sarah, you can just read out those scores to me. Okay. Mm -hmm. I can see uh, eight and ah. uh, eight and five. Okay. This is the best. Okay. Uh, yeah, the best is eight. The, the least is five for one person. Okay. All right. Okay, eight and five. So they gave the both scores, eight and five. Okay, yes, because yes. they obviously to do the, the, the most challenging as well. So eight and five, anybody else? And that's actually great if you can give your best and give your most challenging score. So we have an eight and five. Anyone else? 14 and six. 14 and six, awesome, all right, all right. And you can notice the disparity. We'll just take one more. Okay, great. I'm sure people were able to do it. Now, nine and six. Nine and six. Great, great. Now, that's great. I won't get into it because of time. How did that person make you feel? That's actually what I wanted to, to drive. 
Remember I talked about self-awareness and how somebody makes you feel. If you could give one word to describe how that person made you feel, what would that one word be? And you can do either the most challenging or you can do the best. One word. So typically when I do this exercise, I will get things like motivated. The good boss made me feel motivated. The most challenging boss made me feel depressed. <laughs> Imagine going through your work experience like that. So maybe people can unmute themselves and they can share either one. This one we don't have to put it in the chat. Just if we anybody. Have, mm -hmm. we, we have already sad and great. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Okay. Uh, good and not so. Uh, yeah, right. Yeah. Not so good, right. Right. In fact, the emotional vocabulary, ladies and gentlemen, is over 10,000 words. There are 10,000, over 10,000 ways to describe feelings that you have. And actually, part of emotional intelligence is becoming uh, familiar with that vocabulary so that you can pinpoint even gradations of anger and sadness. There's different ways to describe sadness, melancholy, you know, different, different things. And the more that you begin to expand your emotional vocabulary, the better you become in being able to engage others, manage your emotions as well as the emotions of other people. All right, so I'll just move on. I'm glad you did that exercise. I said it once, I'll say it again. Are you show up affects the way people feel. How they feel affects the way they engage with you. The challenging boss showed up, and by showed up, maybe the way they spoke to you, maybe the way that they, you know, they, they interacted with you, that was them showing up, made you feel sad, depressed, not good. And then that engagement with that person who didn't make you feel good was obviously hampered. Somebody who doesn't make you feel good means that you won't put in any discretionary effort, you might not want to show up. You might be resentful. You might be passive aggressive. There's so many things. Conversely, the person who makes you feel great, how good is it if you make somebody feel great? They go the extra mile. They put in that discretionary effort. They will go over, above, and beyond what they're supposed to do. If you are being ranked, how do you make people feel? How do you make your clients feel when you are working with them? This is important because we have six key areas. Now, this is the Genos model that we're using. Sarah, you mentioned that I am certified by Genos International. So different organizations might have a different model, but I love this model because it's about showing up. It's about behavior and behavior can be changed. It can be modified. So these are the core emotional skills that we're talking about. Self-awareness, we've already done already a couple of mini exercises in that. Awareness of others. So this is an awareness of how other people are feeling. And by the way, if you look at this, on the right-hand side, those so-called productive states are where we want to be when we are dealing with people. And we want to have less of what's on the other side. So for example, if we lack an awareness of other people, we're just my way or the highway, bend or spend it, then we are described as insensitive as opposed to being empathetic. And if there's anything in your line of work, mediators and arbitrators, isn't it empathy? Don't you need that in spades? Okay, then there is authenticity, there is emotional reasoning, there is self-management and there's inspiring performance. And by inspiring performance means that you're giving off that positive energy. You walk into the room, the way you speak, the way you act, the way you walk, the way you talk, the way you do all of these things makes people want to be better. Okay. Now, each of these topics is, is like a two-day seminar. Clearly, we don't have that. We have an hour. So I'm not going to go into them in detail each. Suffice it to say that 
they're all important. Maybe we can do this. Let's try doing this. So this is how it plays out at work. Remember some of those questions I asked you? So the first question was, did that boss demonstrate an awareness of their mood and feelings? That is self-awareness. Self-awareness is you knowing how you feel at any given time. And then knowing how you feel means you can choose how to deal with it. Now, choosing how to deal with it, that's the skill. That's a skill of, okay, I feel triggered. I feel annoyed. And my tattoo guy has, 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 has really triggered me or this client has triggered me. What is it that I can do? What are the techniques that I can employ to calm myself down? But it starts with that self-awareness. Okay, remember the second question I asked you? makes other people feel appreciated. That's the awareness of others. How, and by the way, and some of, this is not even, as they say, rocket science. How can you make people feel appreciated the moment you walk into a room with them? What, what are the, some of the obvious answers over there? Just making somebody feel appreciated. I mean, without even thinking about it, particularly in your line of work. Maybe I'd love to hear from you. How can you make people, and I'm talking about you know, the people that you work with, how do you make them feel appreciated? Any, any comments there, Sarah? Um, handshake. Okay. Give, give them a handshake. But now, even in your COVID, we're not <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so what are we doing? But yeah, obviously a handshake. Yeah. In fact, in other you know, lessons that I teach, I actually deconstruct the handshake and it takes me an hour, the power of the handshake, you know, web to web and all of that sort of stuff. I won't get into that topic today. All right, handshake, good handshake. Uh, compliment. Compliment them, yeah, simple. Sarah, I love that scarf you're wearing. That yellow brings out your big, beautiful eyes. Can you come here? <laughs> that person is already on your side. EI in practice, easy peasy. Come on, these. So stuff like that. And it's, it's actually, yes, it's simple, but there's also a sort of deeper um, effect to this, making other people feel appreciated. Awareness of others, um, body language, and so on and so forth. All right, what was the third question I asked you? It was, um, yeah, where is it? Open and honest. Open and honest. Yeah. And that is authenticity. Now, authenticity is a word that is bandied around. To me, my understanding of authenticity is the best version of yourself. And the best version of myself is not necessarily to say, this is who I am, take it or leave it. This is me being authentic. Particularly if that take it or leave it rubs people the wrong way. So it's about discovering the positives that you have and then, you know, letting people know that this is who I am. And that open and honest about mistakes is also that vulnerability, which I think is important in your profession. I don't have all the answers, but I'm going to try and see how I can get the two of you to be able to do this. You know, that sort of authenticity. I can talk more about it. All right. So there was emotional reasoning, uh, there's a question there about ethical decisions. I didn't do that question. I just want to go through all of these and positive influence. Okay. I think the main thing to remember is that each of those areas are areas that can be worked on uh, to bring out your, your EI. Okay. So I kind of want to segue into another area of emotional intelligence, which is about resilience, which is, of course, for me, the last you know, few months, this has been the bulk of the work I've been doing since our world changed, this black swan, which has changed our, our lives forever. And I, you, I love this story um, because it's, it's from a real book. This book, Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers. This is an actual book. And, you know, if you look at the life of a zebra, so a zebra wakes up in the morning, it goes out into the plane and starts having breakfast, eating grass, okay? While it is eating this grass, in the bush over there, what is there? That king of the jungle, the lion, right? That lion comes charging out of the bush, 
and begins chasing the zebra. Okay, so the zebra's meal is rudely interrupted. Now, if this zebra survives and the lion gets its cousin, for example, you know what the zebra does? Something very interesting. The zebra has a mechanism where it completely forgets that it had been running for its life, which by the way is arguably the most stressful thing that you can happen. You're literally <laughs> running to escape being somebody else's breakfast. I mean, imagine if you were that zebra, that stress you're having, but it resets its mechanism. It goes back to having its breakfast. It had been rudely interrupted. And it doesn't even look over its shoulder wondering if there's another lion coming. It's like the incident never happened. And it does that three times a day, lunchtime and at dinner time. <laughs> okay. Now, as I said, if you were a human being and you had to go through that, one day of the life of a zebra, you will say, I can't live this life. You're running for my life, everything, because the stress would just kill us. Okay? What we can take from this is to have the resilience of the zebra. And that's why zebras don't suffer from chronic stress. They don't get ulcers, whereas we as human beings do. So we get a setback today, we are thinking about it tomorrow, the day after, and it haunts us for the next six weeks. Oh, COVID, my God. And we, every time we pick up the phone, we're just complaining. This developing of resilience is one of the key attributes that you need, not just as somebody who is in your profession, but as a human being. And by the way, we all have some resilience. We need to be able to activate it but start working on your resilience, okay? And I'm going to, maybe there's some practical things that you can do. Practical things you can do to help you with setbacks that you might suffer through the day. For example, when you get up in the morning, the first thing, instead of scrolling through your WhatsApp messages from last night, perhaps you can start with, I don't know, meditation? mindfulness practice some people might even say prayer okay prayer is good but we want something that's going to be intentional in terms of setting up your success for the rest of the day how about journaling writing down those feelings at the end of the day if this client or this you know the, the, whatever you whoever you're dealing with really triggered you during the day write down those feelings and why do you feel that way these are all some simple steps that we can do to begin to develop this resilience that I'm talking about, and many more. I'll move on. Okay, so usually at this portion of a talk like this, or when I'm having this conversation with people, I've thrown a lot at you, and forgive me for this analogy, it's like being a mosquito in a nudist colony, or a room full of people without clothes. Now, I, please, I don't want you fixated on that image. Suffice it to say, you're a mosquito. You know what to do. But where do you start? Because it's everywhere, right? So where can you start? We start with self-awareness. We start with authenticity. Where do we start? Derek, you've given us a lot of great tidbits. Where can we start? Well, you know, how about this? How about find out where you are in terms of your own EI, emotional intelligence? So one of the things we do through my organization in conjunction, obviously, because I'm journal trained, is we take our clients through some detailed assessment tests. You cannot fix it. I shouldn't use that word. You cannot work on yourself if you don't know where you stand. Where do you rank? So taking an assessment test, just like you take a personality test, and I'm sure there may be people here who have taken some sort of even emotional intelligence test, although we like to say that ours is the best in the market. This is one of those, I've just picked a page from that test. It has a lot on it. I'm just going to point out one thing, that it's talking about self-awareness. And it, what's great about this test is that assessment is that it is other people giving their feedback about you. So, uh, Catherine, I can see you on the screen just based on my, the setup of my Zoom screen. 
So I'm going to use you as an example, Catherine. Catherine, you would go to, give me an example of somebody that you work with closely. Could be a member of your team. I mean, and professionally, you're not going to your, your show show for this. No, we want professional feedback. So Catherine, maybe you can unmute yourself. Who's somebody professionally that you work with closely? It could be even Salome. a client. Salome, right. So we would go to Salome yes. and ask Salome, when it comes to Catherine and her self-awareness, first of all, Salome, how important is self-awareness to you? So Salome might say, and again, I'll give that ranking on a scale of one to five. Salome might say self-awareness, particularly the work we do, very important. I'm going to give it a 4.5. Fantastic. Okay, so where is Catherine on this scale of one to five? Well, Catherine is maybe a three. Okay, then there are seven other categories under self-awareness. Like, does she demonstrate an awareness of how she feels? How does she uh, interact with others uh, and impact their feelings? And each of those has a scale. So it's as detailed as you can get in terms of just that one area of self-awareness. And we do that for all of those six areas that I mentioned. <clears throat> and then there's also, because numbers are great, because you can measure them, because you can take it today and then you can take it after six months and see if you have improved. But we also get uh, qualitative feedback. So it's not just quantitative, it's qualitative. And these reports are beautiful. The rest, do I have one of them over here on my desk? Uh, let me see. Ah, yeah, yeah, I do. So here are these beautiful bound reports with all of that information. Okay, so that's a great place to start. Here's another place you can start. As an organization, as a, as a team, take the emotional climate index test or emotional culture index. And particularly during these unusual days, this is something we've carried out for very many people. How do you feel currently? And we go through a whole matrix of how you're feeling. Okay. How do you expect to feel? Again, we get a whole matrix of things. What do you ideally think or how should you ideally feel given the current state of circumstances? Anxious, appreciated, mistreated, so on and so forth. Again, reports like this allow you to see where you are, where your team is, and then what can we do to improve it? And then Derek comes in, we work on these things, we look at that report, and then we evaluate again after six months. Okay. Uh, one of my favorite athletes of all time, Mike Tyson. And this is a Mike Tyson quote. Everybody has a plan until they get hit. You train in the gym, you work out, the fight night comes, the big fight, you stand up there and the first punch lands. And everything that you had trained goes out the window because we're human beings, right? And that's the equivalent of this EI. We can do all of these things and work on them and then we're faced with the reality of the situation. But the great thing about EI is that it's about developing this skill so we can get up and we can think about some of these things that we have to do. We can redouble on our journaling. We can talk about how we can use the neofrontal cortex instead of getting the amygdala hijack when dealing with a stressful client or a, a stressful team member, all of these things. So you, it, it, it's, I, I think Malcolm Gladwell said that to become an expert at anything, you need to practice it at least 10,000 times. So 10,000 times get hit, 10,000 times you find a way, figure a way of dealing with this. And all of a sudden, these things don't trigger you anymore. You have found a way of cultivating your self-awareness, being aware of other people, being as authentic as you can be, using emotional reasoning, particularly when you're in difficult situations, having lots of self-management 
and inspiring people around you through how you interact with them, how you show up. Because how you show up affects how people feel and how they feel affects the way that they will engage with you and engage with other people. By the way, that analogy that I used about the transfer of energy, that energy transfers to you, but do you know that it is also transferred to a third or a fourth party? So you come into the office and you had a rough weekend and somebody asks you an innocent question like, uh, how was your weekend? And your response is, Kwanu metuma. And, and the other person's like, what? I mean, how do you say that? I just asked you how you were. But you know what happens? That person then begins to think and say, why did I get that answer? And then they go and they say, hey, Dan, I, where, where was that coffee? I thought you left it here on Friday. Well, Diana asks you. And then all of a sudden you find yourself saying, Kwanu ni kaziyako. And all of a sudden you find that an entire department or organization has been infected through this transfer of negative energy. So there are consequences to this. Okay, uh, I was asked to talk about some of the programs that we run, so I'm just going to leave them on the screen there briefly. Maybe we'll come back to them if anybody is interested because we are winding down. But pertaining to this particular conversation, I love the words of Maya Angelou. People will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but they will never forget how you made them feel. We live in the emotional economy. There are no two ways about that. Now more than ever, particularly as we're trying to communicate through this virtual medium, you have to work even harder. So, um, yeah, I wish you all the best. All right, I'm gonna pause there before I share some of my contacts and things, and maybe we can engage you in, I don't know, some feedback, questions. So I'll just stop sharing, and, but I'll come back and share my contact information. Okay. Um, thank you very much, uh, Derek. Uh, that was quite uh, interesting and enga engaging as, as well. Um, just a, a few questions already uh, before we have some from, uh, uh, you know, some people also voicing. Um, does the emotional intelligence index change over time uh, or season? So is this an assessment that you do one off or would you need to take it at regular intervals? Great question. So what happens is, so if we took it with a team today, they may be feeling a certain way. So I remember we took this a lot three months after this thing hit. And as you can imagine, teams were just, I mean, they were off the scale in terms of how they were feeling, working from home, da, 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 everything is going on. Then ideally what we do is we work with you and we say, this is what we can do for you guys to do with your anxiousness, your stress, your anxiety, your, everything that you're going through. After six months, let's take it again so that we can see. And then this is also your ROI to see, okay, we did this, we implemented this, team leaders did this, this is what we did, this is what we worked on, and this is where we are. So ideally that's how it should be, it should be done. You take it once and then you take it after a period of time when you have worked on some of these things. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that. Um, uh, another question is the, how uh, can you as a mediator manage parties who appear to put the other party down without appearing uh, condescending? So you have, you know, your parties before you as a mediator. So how do you manage them when you see one uh, party is trying to put the other party down? Okay. So I would approach that from two things. First of all, I would actually approach that from myself, not even about the two parties. How do I feel when that person talks to that person that way, puts them down? Does that also trigger me? Do I change? Does my facial expression change? Does my tone of voice change? Because that is also uh, absorbed, if you will, by those two parties there and might change everything. Okay, so that's number one. How, 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 does, it, how does it affect me and how am I dealing with it? Okay, and then secondly, 
somebody behaving in a way that is not productive. Okay, what is going on with this particular person? Why would they speak in a certain way? Why do they keep putting that person down? Is it, what is the relationship between them? Are there unresolved issues? Is there, so you could begin to dig a little bit deeper through these um, sort of emotionally intelligent channels to find out that why would somebody speak to somebody that way? And then once you're able to find out that that's what is triggering them, for them to behave that way, then you can address it. Now, obviously, every case is going to be different. This is not a one-size-fits-all. It's not the same bandage that you can put on every single wound. As I said, what is the relationship between those two parties? Okay? But perhaps it starts with some of the language that you could use in terms of talking to that person about the way that they speak to that other party for example. But the way I would approach it, just to sort of reiterate my main answer, would be to find out why does this person trigger you to speak in that particular manner. Okay. Uh, thank you for that. Cool. Um, is it possible to tell uh, what kind of a person I am and how people perceive me uh, from the interaction that I have with them? <laughs> Is it possible to tell what kind of a person I, I am and how people perceive me from the interaction I have with them? I suppose this uh, perhaps refers to if, if you don't go through the formal assessment. Are you able to somehow be able to gauge? All right, let me make sure I understand it. Is it possible to understand the kind of person I am? Mm -hmm. Without? And how? Mm -hmm. Sorry, yes, keep yes. going. Is it possible to tell what kind of a person I am and how people perceive me from the engagement that, that you have with them? It is possible. I mean, you don't have to take the test for people to <laughs> know that this is how you behave. This is you know, or the things that trigger you. But as I said, the logical part of that would be, <clears throat> I want to know who I am and I want to know how to make me myself a better person. And so what the, the assessment does is that it gives you greater insight into why you might be behaving the way that you behave and what you need to do in order for you to become better at self-management or emotional reasoning or self-awareness. So short answer, yes, it's possible, but the assessment gives you greater insight. Uh, thank you for that. Um, Lawi? Uh, Lawi, would you like to? Uh... Okay. I'll just. Uh... Mm -hmm. In a minute. Um. Okay, on the core emotional intelligence skills, uh, what would you propose uh, that someone should, on the core EI skills, where would you propose someone should start or the most effective point to begin? That's an easy question to answer, self-awareness. Self-awareness is the gateway to emotional intelligence. Once you start working on your self-awareness, it then lends you to begin to improve on any of those other areas. Now, practically speaking, what I would say for anybody who is part of this conversation is number one, start 
literally writing down how you feel at regular periods throughout the day. Okay, it could be every hour, it could be in the morning, lunchtime, in the evening. Just take 30 seconds or a minute and begin jotting down how you're feeling. Okay, once you've put that down and you find maybe there's a pattern, this is how I feel. And that feeling, again, as I said, expanding your emotional vocabulary. So don't just say I'm feeling pissed. I'm feeling angry. Like, delve into it. You can even begin by even sensations in your body. Like I know when I, I'm getting triggered, I, I feel those sensations, right? The tingling in my fingers. Sometimes I feel it here in my stomach. So start being aware of some of these um, signals that your body is giving you and write them down. And then you can begin to self dress. Okay, why did this make me angry? What outcome did I want? You know, what did that person do? What can I do to either prevent it or to work on it? Those questions will come naturally to you once you have seen them, particularly in front of you. So begin with self-awareness. Uh, thank you. Um... If clients or disputants uh, took the EI assessment mm -hmm. or had heightened awareness, would this shift the tra trajectory of the disputes and journey towards settlement agreement or perhaps uh, speed to reach a better agreement or more successful mediation? Who asked that question, Sarah? That is brilliant. <laughs> that is brilliant. I should have come up with that myself. <laughs> Imagine giving them this uh, assessment. It's not really a test. Test is not the right word. It's, it's, it's just an assessment. And then it's a report. And then getting that, 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 that report, which shows them that this is how I am. It's an insight. It's the Johari window, right? This is what people are seeing. I think it would be, it would move the needle in terms of helping you bring these two parties to some sort of an agreement. Absolutely, yes, brilliant. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, how do I mend my relationship with my former employee? How do I mend my relationship with my former employee? Okay. Um, please don't take my smile as me making light of the issue. The only reason I smile when I hear that, because if I had a shilling for every time I've been asked that question, I, I would be a very rich man. So here is the, the thing. That, that is not a question that I could give you an answer right away. I would need to know the details of your relationship with your former employee. But what I could tell you is that one of the things to do is you have to start working, I have said this, is you have to start working on yourself. So when you think of your former employee, when you think of your former boss, when you think of your former teammates, what are the emotions that come up, okay? Why do you feel that way? And I'd imagine, Pat, based on the question, that those feelings are not necessarily good feelings. But rather than shifting the onus to that side, I would start on working with myself. Okay, so one of the things I mentioned, for example, was empathy. One of the hardest things to do is take the side of your former employer rather than your side. Look at things from their perspective. Once you start that thought pattern, it then opens up these avenues of reconciliation that you may not have thought before. We're human beings. We are ego-driven. It's always about me, 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 me. But start putting yourself in the shoes of the other person and you'll begin to see solutions that weren't there before. That would be a start. 
Um, thank you. Um, do feelings affect men as much as they affect women? Do feelings affect men as much as they affect uh, women? Or are men better equipped to manage uh, their feelings? Or are men better equipped to manage their feelings? Then uh, perhaps together with that, you can also address how can we help children to grow into emotional intelligence? How can mm. we help children to grow into emotional intelligence? Okay. So again, that's a very interesting question. And as you can imagine, that's something that a lot of people have studied. Are men and women wired differently when it comes to EI? So do feelings affect them more? And the conventional wisdom is usually that women are wired better when it comes to handling emotions. But I can tell you from my personal experience doing this for the last few years, there isn't that much difference between how men and women act in certain circumstances because our brains are the same. The amygdala hijack is the same in men and in women. Okay? Developing these skills of emotional reason and self-awareness and awareness of others is an individual uh, thing or an individual choice. I, I, from my evidence doesn't show that it's about men or women. And I would never use that as a premise for saying that's why somebody acts that way. Somebody acts that way because of unresolved issues that that person has stemming from childhood. Those unresolved issues are found equally in men and women. Resolve your childhood issues and you will find that your engagement and interaction with people in, as an adult will change. Second question about children. Do you know in countries like Germany, Australia, Sweden, they are introducing emotional intelligence into the school curriculum as young as primary school, teaching them empathy and resilience and removing your ego and emotional reasoning because these are the skills that we all need in this brave new world with artificial intelligence coming, machine learning. But at the core is how we interact with each other. So yes, if you have young children, we can talk about how we can engage them. We have some sessions that we run for younger clients. So to answer that question, yes. Okay. Yes, uh, just a minute. Um, does morning physical exercise mm -hmm. and uh, the way I command my day affect my emotional intelligence? Does morning physical exercise and the way I command my day affect my emotional intelligence? Absolutely. There is a direct correlation between uh, physicality and mentality. If you are somebody who is generally more physically active, you will find that you are able to handle particularly difficult issues better. The science is undeniable and the research is overwhelming. Remember how I talked a little bit about starting your day? Part of my morning routine involves physical activity. There are no two ways about it. It fires up those endorphins, it raises my dopamine levels, it lowers the cortisol, the stress hormone. I'm able to approach my tasks far much better when I'm more active than when I'm sedentary. So yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, how do I make my colleagues in the same profession where we clash every day and give a cold shoulder now and then feel appreciated and loved. How do I make my colleagues in the same profession where we clash every day and give a cold shoulder now and then feel appreciated and loved? Okay, I mean, I would start with some very simple things. 
uh, you know, bringing in you know, tea and mandazi in the morning or something like that, making sure that you compliment them. Some obviously very simple, but, but, but effective things. You know, the words out of your mouth. That engagement is about how you engage people, affects how they, how they, how they feel about you. But then also, particularly if you have a somewhat difficult or stressful relationship with team members, I, I would love you to do one-on-ones, find out really what drives them. If you're curious about people, you would be, in, you'd be surprised to find out that there are certain things that drive them to behave a certain way. So just finding out a little bit more about what's going on in their personal lives in a way that's not going to be intrusive can make a working relationship really thrive, I found. So start now. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. Uh, ca kindly share with us uh, some of the specific questions one can ask and answer to bring out the real self for the purpose of knowing oneself uh, very well or much better. Kindly share with us some of the specific yep. questions yep. one can ask or answer to bring out the real self to know oneself better. Okay, but let me just read those specific questions. I'll just pull up the self-awareness. Okay, there are some things you can ask yourself. Um, do you have an awareness of how you feel? I've said that several times. How do you respond to feedback from other people? you ask other people for feedback on your uh, on your behavior so maybe you've you know worked on a project together you've done something together just ask how did I come across how did I you know maybe you've you've been involved with these two parties and there's somebody there ask them how, how, how did I come across okay um, write down how you think you behave and then Ask other people if they see that in you. In other words, are you consistent with how you describe yourself to be? All right. Are you aware of the impact your feelings have on other people? So start with some of those questions. And that's just, you know, the, developing this thing called self-awareness oh, on one more do my emotions have an impact on the way that i think sarah um yes uh, i just wanted to make sure you could hear me okay yes yes we can thank you i'm sure the questions are flooding in i should really be helping you actually in the chat <laughs> No problem. That's fine. That's okay. Um, so just uh, this is this is uh, uh, f from our experience as mediators, who are some of us setting up independent uh, mediation practices. And uh, the question is, you know, from your own journey and experience in uh, uh, people service related uh, consulting, uh, what are some of the tips, success tips that you can share with mediators? What are some of the pitfalls? and uh, innovative approaches that uh, can be used to be able to set up a successful uh, uh, practice. Okay, uh, let me give you some. Uh, so, becoming, paying a little bit more attention, particularly to non-verbals of other people, all right? Which I'm sure everyone here does. But that can give you greater insight into somebody's um, emotional state, if you will. All right. Uh, being able to ask these sort of open and probing type of questions, particularly when it comes to their thoughts, their feelings and perspectives. It's almost like you're a coach. So how do you feel? Okay, why do you feel that way? Why do you think you feel, you feel, you feel that way? That sort of thing. And when you start asking those questions, particularly as they're probing the emotional state, you get a greater insight and that I think would only help particularly when it comes to mediation. Okay. Uh, let me see what else. Yeah, I think it's fine. 
stop it. Okay. I don't want to give away everything, ladies and gentlemen. I want you to be able to come to me and say, you know what? <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> That's a good tip right there. Thank you. <laughs> you don't give away too much. Okay, uh, we are just uh, perhaps coming to a close. And uh, 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 probably the, the very last one is, how do I handle people? Oh, just a minute. who consider my authenticity intimidation. How do I handle people who consider my authenticity intimidation? You could take that and then you could share with us, you know, what, what are those things that we need to come to you for after that? Okay, I'm actually sharing my screen. I don't know if you can see that. Yes, we can. Uh, just give me one second here, sorry. Okay, no problem. Okay, so that's my contact information. Right, so, uh, sir, I, uh, I really do apologize. I think I was trying to do two tasks as well. Just kindly repeat the question so that I can answer it correct. Okay, uh, how do I handle those who consider my authenticity a, a form of intimidation? How do I handle those who consider my authenticity a form of intimidation? That's a good question. There is something we talk about in the world of emotional intelligence, about authenticity. Being able to express how you feel at the right time, at the right place, to the right degree. If that's the feedback you're getting, that is what you're giving off you are giving off that demeanor that might be intimidating to the other person. So, um, perhaps what you need to work on is how you can express yourself clearly in a way that is less authoritative. You can work on softening Maybe some of your nonverbals, could be your body language, your tone of voice. You can work on using certain words. So, for example, I like to have my clients write down certain words that they typically use, and you'll find that that language can be judged as, in your case, intimidating, so that you can replace that with certain words that may be less aggressive. Uh, feedback is great and feedback from a party that is going has your best interests at heart so having somebody else there who can give you almost instant feedback on how you spoke to a particular person uh, that is also good um, feedback is actually at the core of a lot of what we do because it's behavior this emotional intelligence I would start with those few things to work on becoming less intimidating. Uh, thank you. You can proceed kindly. Can you see my screen, Sarah? Yes, yes, we can. Okay. So that's my contact information. And as I said before, there are few other courses that we, we have over and above even the emotional intelligence. So for example, we are working with a lot of teams in terms of developing their, um, how to lead teams virtually, how to connect better with clients and customers, particularly if you're doing this through here. And now my understanding is that a lot of you are still, still on the ground doing it face to face, but if you're doing virtual meetings, it's a different skill set for sure. Public speaking and presentation skills is a must have, I think, for people who are in your world. So how to be able to effectively persuade people, get your thoughts across, negotiation. Uh, personal branding is no matter what profession you're in. 
Okay, and then of course, things like the work-life balance and personal management and, uh, and even customer service. So these are some of the areas that I think particularly during this time would be helpful for all of you. Okay, um, thank you very much uh, for that, uh, Derek. Um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we are at the sunrise morning session that has been running from uh, seven o'clock. Uh, our topic has been emotional intelligence for mediation and dispute resolution uh, professionals. Uh, with our guest speaker, Mr. Derek Banga, who is a trainer, a coach and facilitator with his company, uh, Public Image. I will invite uh, Wangari uh, uh, Kabiro, who is the convener, to be able to give uh, some comments. Wangari. Okay. <laughs> Derek, it's wonderful to see you, and I really, really thank you for your generous sharing with the colleagues. And I, I truly believe that with the mediators community, this is just um, the beginning. Um, the beginning in two ways, we enrolling you in as a practitioner and also I see like on your schedule of um, um, offerings, negotiation skills, customer mm -hmm. service skills, which really are skills we require as uh, practitioners. So I see it as a great, great um, opening. I'm also delighted to uh, be able to see the colleagues who are on the call and also the others who will have um, uh, listening on this recording. Um, one of the great things that delights us is that um, um, Emotional intelligence seems to be getting very heightened awareness. I'm, I'm really delighted that you even pointed out Jack Ma. You know, when we think about, uh, you know, entrepreneur eh, uh, the, of, of the year, like a, across the globe, and also someone who's, um, who has very personal respectability. So mm -hmm. probably that points out how come um, not only is he, um, uh, let me say, a business mogul, but he's also someone who is taken as a mentor, and you know, he does great things um, around this world. And truly we, we believe that we are part, um, uh, very, very a part of that. I'm delighted to see the comments that are coming in from um, the colleagues. I, uh, we, we have comments that are saying, you know, it's been very insightful. And uh, also we have uh, colleagues who are even mentioning that even for themselves, they feel, you know, much better now. And I think what you're trying to say is that this is just um, no, not even a tip of it. Someone can actually have much more of this. So colleagues, um, yeah, the Derek Banga has shared his contact. Feel, uh, please feel free to reach out to him um, directly. We would be delighted to be able to see how we probably can even engage further. And yes, I, wish, I really want to thank you. Please uh, pass our regards to your colleagues who have um, also uh, you know, been very resourceful in helping us to get this session to here. And we know that they are also in uh, various other activities. Uh, Moderator Sarah Ter, I wish to thank you for this particular session. Oh yes, Sarah, your scarf is lovely. It brings out your eyes. <laughs> Let me flash back. <laughs> yeah, now that we were, yeah, we were given that hint by Derek. I think anytime I see it, I'll, I'll always um, uh, be, bring, uh, be raising that, um, that, 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 that with yourself. So colleagues, um, as uh, we wrap this session, we have our second session today during our October symposium day. We have our second session uh, coming up today, and that will be at 2 p.m. Um, when we were getting um, Mr. Derek Banga, we were told that he's an early badge, and uh, that's why uh, you actually, we actually have him for the sunrise session. So it doesn't mean that the others who are coming in the other sessions are uh, any later badge or not early badge. It's just that he's the earliest badge, uh, generally. Uh, so at 2 p.m., we, uh, we will have our session with um, Mr. Uh, John uh, M. Ohaga. John M. Ohaga is a managing partner and also the co-head of dispute resolution in the firm Triple OK Law. Significantly for we mediators is that he sits on literally every panel either you are trying to get into or every panel you seem to be into. And when I say that, I mean he's a director at the NCIA, which is the Nairobi Center for International Arbitration, which uh, hosts a mediation panel. Um, he also sits in the Judiciary Mediation Accreditation Committee, and he's the head of the accreditation committee, the one who decides whether you will be signed up to become um, a mediator uh, at the judiciary or not. And then also, um, uh, in this year, he was appointed by the Attorney General to also head the 
ADR policy for Kenya, uh, a committee that was established to, and, and they were given six months and we haven't yet got the report, so probably uh, yeah, an extension um, of, 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 the, of, um, of their work. And we, we invited him to come and speak to us on the economics of dispute in Kenya. We, our work is around dispute, as around dispute. So could we understand, you know, wh I mean, who, who are the players? Who's really playing in there? Because mediators, our game is still not yet in properly. Um, in the evening, and that's for our sunset session at 4 p.m., we have Madame Nina Mutegi, uh, who's the chief executive officer of Mirema School. Mirema School is um, one of the schools uh, in the country that um, uh, has um, what you can call inclusive education. They have they run uh, the uh, uh, school for all for all um, learners. So they have also learning for the uh, children who are able differently. And also from high experiences, we are able to learn on how as practitioners we are able to develop our practice and also at the same time be able to have greater awareness coming even from the session we've, host, we've held today with um, emotional intelligence on how to be able to serve and even work better with peers and colleagues and uh, disputants and clients who may have special needs or uh, persons with disabilities. So colleagues, I thank you for uh, this time. Mr. Derek Banga, thank you for um, having us, uh, being with us uh, during this particular session. Uh, moderator Sarah Terrell, once again, thank you for your time and God bless your morning. And uh, for everyone who's going to uh, start uh, uh, homeschooling, uh, everyone who's going uh, now to start their, ho their home office or getting uh, now to right into their uh, workplaces spaces, please be well and God bless you. Thank you. Thank you, Wangari. Have an emotionally intelligent day, everybody. Asante sana. Yes. Uh, I appreciate okay. the comments. I've seen them in the chat. So thank you, everybody. Wonderful. Thanks, Sarah. Okay. Um, uh, thank you very much, uh, Wangari. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Derek Banga, for your time, uh, you know, the challenge, the insights. Uh, very good for us uh, in this uh, session. Uh, thank you, colleagues and delegates, for joining our session. Uh, we believe that uh, you have gained very useful insight for our practice and for our life uh, in general. Uh, I have been your moderator uh, for this particular session, uh, Sarah Atter, and we shall close uh, with a recitation of the national anthem in Kiswahili. E mungu nguvu yetu ilete baraka kwetu haki iwengao na mlinzi na tukai na undugu amani na uhuru Raha to party now, Stawi. Have a good day, everybody, and God bless. <laughs>